Good morning. We welcome everyone this morning to our worship service. Any visitors here, we uh, appreciate you sharing your time with us this morning in worship. And we're going to get started with our birthdays. If anyone's celebrating a birthday this week, here comes Laura. Oh, and Ellen. Laura put in for Molly because Molly's late. So, um. <laughs> all right. Any other birthdays? If not, let's sing Happy Birthday. about anniversaries? Are there any anniversaries to celebrate? No hands. Okay, we'll move on to announcements. 40 Hours of Prayer will be starting on Friday, March 29th. That will be on Good Friday in the afternoon at 2.30. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer uh, for you to pick a one-hour slot. Uh, we stay in prayer for 40 hours up until um, 6.30 on Easter morning for our sunrise service. Um, we've done this for a lot of years. So if you're interested in doing that, you do not have to pray the whole hour. You can read your Bible, you can um, just praise, worship. Uh, but if you wanna do it at home, if you sign up and you're gonna do it at home, please write home beside your name so the person behind you or in front of you will know that, that we haven't missed a spot. So um, we did that, started that during COVID for people who couldn't come. So there are still some slots out there. They're not just the best slots, but we have to fill them just the same. So um, take a look as you leave and sign up out there and put your number beside there. So um, if we have any changes, we can let you know. Easter egg hunt. Karina, you wanna say anything about that? Yeah, a community Easter egg hunt. So if you want to bring candy to help fill eggs for the Easter egg hunt, bring it by the 23rd here to church. There's a Good Friday service on, on Friday the 29th at 6.30 p.m. And then our Easter sunrise service it will be at 6.30 a.m. on Easter Sunday. And then there's breakfast after that at 7.30. You just bring a, a um, breakfast dish. Um, and join us for breakfast after the sunrise service. And then we'll have regular, there we go. <laughs> Easter service is gonna be at 9 a.m. Um, on Sunday. And then um, we will, ha are we having Sunday school after that? Who are you pointing at? <laughs> are we having Sunday school? Nobody's, everybody's just, okay. Count on Sunday school that day anyway. I don't think that's under my job description. <laughs> uh, the church directory update. Um, is Heather here? Do you need to say anything about that? And you do not have to be a member of our church. If you just attend our church and you'd like to be in the directory, that's, that's okay too. So just keep that in mind. And if you think you don't, haven't you know, officially joined our church. If it, you attend here, just be sure to get signed up. And uh, if you have any trouble finding a date, speak to Heather or Kathy Smith about that. Save the date, Vacation Bible School. Sharon, you got anything to say about that? Did you get any volunteers last week? Okay, <laughs> there were a few volunteers last week. So if you still be interested in helping with Bi Vacation Bible School, speak to Sharon Frazee, please. The food pantry still has food over there. It's in the fellowship hall. Um, just if you or you know someone that could use some extra help, 
just go over and get it in the fellowship hall. There's bags over there. You don't have to say anything. There might still be some food in the freezer. Uh, you can check that out also. Jamie? While he's coming up here, I've got a thank you also. I'll read. Um, Hemsbury Christian Church, thank you for all your prayers and for the ones who brought food and checked up on our family. I am in, um, on the mend and thank God for this. Missy Smith and family. All right, so that was just a little bit of a, the program, a thousand day program that is uh, run by our friends, Many Hands for Haiti. And uh, we contacted them the other day because uh, at the end of the thousand days, the ladies that go through that program not only get their kids to go to school, but they get a goat, and, and if they have a big enough family, they get a goat and some chickens. And there's a cost to that, and they are given a pregnant goat and some chickens, and that means a lot for them because they can produce more goats, have chickens to either eat or lay eggs. And uh, so we're going to try and raise some funds at this church and Joe Perkins' church and uh, Ron Lusk's church to raise up enough money to buy a few of the goats and chickens for the, this program because we feel that this program really does good in Haiti because of it better, the betterment of the community. And uh, so I have out in the foyer some trifolds and some pamphlets and they're next to my little piggy bank. If you noticed, it's sitting outside. Uh, and Joe Perkins, he came up with this, the name. It was called Animals for Change. Not only does it change the lives of those people that you just saw, but Animals for Change is what you have in your pocket. Pocket change, a couple dollars. Even if you want to write a check, drop it in the piggy bank. We're going to collect for this whole month of March and hopefully between the three churches, we're going to be able to buy some goats, several goats, and several chickens for these families. And uh, feel free to pick up either the flyer or the trifold. There are some outside, and I'll make sure that they keep stocked. And uh, that's, uh, it's just the program's amazing. And uh, those friends, the Many Hands for Haiti, have about 10 of our shade houses that help grow vegetables for these same communities. So we felt that this program needed a little bit more attention, so we're trying to help out. And uh, appreciate it if you can uh, find pocket change and or, you know, a couple of dollar bills or even check. If you do make a check, go ahead and make, it, make the check out to the Hamsbury 
Christian church and then put down there in the little note that it's for SFP and animals for change. And then that way we can get them the cash that's needed to, to buy these animals. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm going to let uh, Judy has something to say, so I'm going to give her the podium. I don't know how many of you were here Friday night, but it was an awesome experience. Um, when Cameron was diagnosed and we decided we were going to have a fundraiser for him, I asked Marla, I said, do you think the church would furnish desserts for the fundraiser? And she said, Judy, of course they would. That's what we're here for. Well, that is what you all are here for. I have never been so overwhelmed with the love of God as I was from you people. I mean, from Eric, who took the day and helped with the T IT, and Brian said he was Eric's assistant that day, and uh, the food. I know the church had to be cleaned afterwards. It was amazing. And I don't know if you've seen Brian's post, but he talked about our church being a family. And, and when, I had, when I had cancer and whenever I had, COVID was bad, and I told Marla how much I missed coming here, you know, I, this is my, you all are my family. And <laughs> I have a family and they love me, but this is my church family. And you all, I got home Friday night and I was sitting in my recliner and I, just, I was just overwhelmed. I thought, those people love me so much. I mean, Daniel doesn't go to church here, and Cameron didn't go, but you did that because you love me. And if you've been a member here for a while, I'm sure you have experienced this love that, that goes on in this church. And if you're new here, don't leave. You'll never be treated with such love and kindness as you are right here. This is the body of Christ, and I am so thankful to be a part of this body, and I am so thankful. There aren't words. You know, I'd like to get up here and have some eloquent, eloquent thing to say to tell you how much I love and appreciate you but I just want you to know from the bottom of my heart I, I, I can never have the words to tell you how much I appreciate everything you did and there are, gonna, there are things happen that I don't even know about but whatever you did to make that Friday night so awesome I truly truly thank you so much I just pray that you will all be blessed as I was blessed thank you I just sat there uh, Friday night, not really doing a whole lot to help, but watching. <laughs> and uh, just as I saw the whole day uh, unfold, I just thought, uh, sometimes we're so hard on the church, um, and we're so hard on ourselves. And I just saw the, the, the people still there at 9 p.m. Uh, cleaning up and taking care of things. And just I thought about the whole day, and uh, I don't know, I just thought, you know, if Jesus came back now, he, there, this, this is a beautiful bride today. And uh, I was just uh, beaming. So, um, well done. absolutely. So, praise God um, for this church. And I, by this church, I mean uh, you. Uh, but continue to pray for uh, the fam family of Cameron uh, as they are... Uh, it's not over. That's not over. Um, we're going to be praying for uh, little Clark. If you're in the, uh, if you're not on the on the uh, prayer request chain, uh, little Clark, AJ and Kendra's little guy had some seizures, and uh, it was just pretty scary for them. But it, they, they sound, sounds like it's not going to be anything long term uh, issue. But continue to pray for for Clark. It sounds like he was able to come home. So is that right? All right. Um, does anybody else have any kind of prayer requests or praises this morning? Mm -hmm. 
Bible club, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Praise, praise, praise God for a Bible club and all that's going on with them. Yeah, David. That's, yeah, that's so cool. I said, yeah, they got to travel for the football season and get to see a lot of things. Um, so uh, we're going to lift up Gary in prayer. Uh, it's Stephanie's stepdad. He's, he's on his, in his final days, uh, so we'll be praying for him and the family. And then if you didn't hear, Sage and the marching Mizzou gets to go to Dublin. Uh, so we'll be, be praying for them as they, as they travel. Yeah, Christina. Natasha Rojas had, had a brain bleed, and sounds that sounds very serious. Be praying for Natasha. Yeah, Kate. Okay. Be praying for Jody. Uh, she has a lot of struggle. Struggle going on right now. Yeah. Okay. Be praying for Miss Betty. She's gotten needs some work on her pacemaker and hopefully that goes smoothly. Yeah, Miss Jack. Okay. Connie's sister's doing, doing well after surgery. Anything else? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh awesome. We praise God for that. Answered prayer. All right. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, as, uh, as I just approach you in prayer and I just think of you in this moment as you are on the throne in heaven. And Father, that just makes me want to fall to my knees as I think of that image of you in all of your glory and majesty and light. And I just think of how amazing it is that we can approach you with all of who we are and you hear our prayers. I'm extremely humbled by that fact. I pray each and every one of us understand how incredible that is. So Father, we just praise you for the work that you have done through this church this past week. God, I praise you for the, the celebration of life that we were able to have for Cameron. God, I, I praise you that uh, even though there is, there is cancer and sickness and hard things here on this earth, Lord, that you have made a way for us to be with you in eternity. I praise you that something that um, comes with extreme hurt and mourning truly turns into dancing. Father, we want to lift up and, and pray for Clark and uh, for mom and dad as well. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would 
just allow this to be just just a blip on the radar for him and that it's, there's no long-term issues and and something that he truly does grow out of but lord we just pray that uh, that would just happen with your your healing and your power god I, I just praise you for the things going on in this church with bible club and and just the way uh and just small little things like giving away magnets lord truly just they're they're just shining the light into our community uh, Lord, into complete strangers' lives are being touched. Thank you to, for the faithfulness of all of those who who surround that or, that that organization and 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 help make it run smoothly. And with Tammy and Kay and Miss Bonnie and and Ben and and Sharon and and Carl and and so many others and Faith and Judy and I can't I won't name them all. But uh, but Lord, thank you so much for for all that happens in that ministry. Uh, Lord, we just want to uh, pray for Gary as he is uh, down to his final days here on earth. Uh, Lord, I, I, I want to pray and lift up the entire family. Uh, Lord, I pray for Stephanie. I pray for, uh, Lord, that you would, just, you would just guard their hearts, that you would comfort uh, the, the hurt. Uh, Lord, that you would, that you would heal in, in mighty ways in that, in that situation. Uh, Lord, we pray for Sage and, and the whole Mizzou marching band team, uh, Lord, as they are traveling to Ireland. I pray that you would just uh, guide them, protect them, uh, Lord, allow them just to, just to be blessed through the opportunity to, to travel, and, and Lord, that they would just, they would just, uh, just enjoy uh, their time away. Lord, we want to lift up Natasha as she is in need of healing. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would be with the doctors and nurses and, and just allow for there to, to be wisdom found and, and for the correct decisions to be made. But Lord, we also pray for, for your healing to happen. God, we, we lift up, uh, uh, we, we lift up uh, Betty Vandelook as she is uh, having struggles with her pacemaker now, Lord. We similarly just pray for your healing to take place. Uh, God, we pray for uh, Connie, we just praise you for Connie's sister and answered prayer in her situation. We thank you so much, Lord, that, that you do answer prayer, that you hear our prayers. We just praise you so much, God, that, that you can do things that, that we can't, that all things truly are possible with you. Father, we just, uh, I just want to lift up this entire service to you today. God, as we just gather together to worship and praise your holy name. God, that we, uh, we would just, as a collective Lord, uh, as, a, as, a, as a church, as a body, we would just praise the name of Jesus today. And God, that everything we say and do would just truly glorify your name. And we pray all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good morning. We have come here this morning to worship him. We have come to praise him. And we have come to tell of his great wonders, his great deeds, and his greatness. So will you please stand and let's turn our eyes upon Jesus. Let's give him all of our worship this morning. Jesus. 
Jesus who bore our sorrows, love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with Hosanna ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power to the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong. Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace.
whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to, and I will make a room for you, to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. Here is where I lay it down, every burden, every crown. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down, every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. And I will make room. Whatever you want to, and I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. Precious, holy, sovereign God, you, Father, are worthy to be praised, hailed, and honored. And so we humbly come before you. We boldly come before your throne we, to bring you this offering, this gift of worship, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you would be glorified through it. Search us, O Lord. Know our hearts. Re just, Father, reveal in us all those things that would just offend you. And we pray, Lord, that you would create within us clean hearts, hearts that are surround, surrendered to you, hearts that are given up for you, Lord. We love you, we praise you, and we offer this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Children's Church is dismissed. Any children... Two through six can go to Tiny Tots, six through 12, Children's Church. Well, welcome. I'm so glad you're here this morning. Uh, we, I didn't look, uh, so what? We got to pay attention to the doors here in 25 minutes, uh, see if anybody... Uh, it's going to be late today. We have the time change that really snuck up on us. Uh, hopefully everything's connected to the internet and uh, your alarms went off without a beat. Uh, didn't skip a beat there and, and we're all good. We're all here. So I'm so glad to have you. We are in week two of a sermon series. Uh, we're, is, we're spending the month of March really trying to build towards Easter, uh, trying to, to build up to Easter morning. And so, so much of the gospel is dedicated to that final week of Jesus' life. And we call it the Passion Week or Holy Week. And I, it's going to be impossible for me to, to touch all of it, but I would like to at least highlight some of these, some of these portions of Jesus' final 
week in his earthly ministry as he was making his way towards the cross. So last week we looked at Palm Sunday. This week we will be looking at Monday. Before we get into that, just a little exercise I'd like to have, uh, and it's not a trick question. I'm not trying to set anybody up or anything, but could anybody, if you could just throw them out at me, mention some miracles that Jesus performed? Water and a wine. There we go. There's one. There's first. Uh, first. Fe- lot, fed a lot of people with a little. <laughs> we got the feeding of the 5,000, the multitudes. What was that? Walked on water. What was that? Raised the dead. The blind could see. Healed the lepers. Lame the walk. He died for that's a big miracle. Changed hearts. Perfect. He drove out demons. Yes, he did. He was resurrected. That was the biggest miracle. Part it. I'm talking about Jesus specifically. Um, but, good. Very good. All right. So, there'll be a point to that. But in Mark chapter 11 uh, is where we're going to be today, uh, beginning at verse 12. But just keep that in mind when we talk about the miracles Jesus performed as he walked this earth. So, we just had Palm Sunday. And at the end of Palm Sunday, right before this, the verse before, it says... Uh, basically, Jesus had time to walk up into the temple. He kind of checked things out, looked around, and then he returned back to Bethany. And so here we are at verse 12. It says, on the following day, we're on Monday, when they came from Bethany, he, speaking of Jesus, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found, could you say this with me? What did he find? He found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. I bet they did, right? Well, Jesus is talking to that tree over there. Did you hear that? (laughs) And so uh, we have, uh, just to pause for a minute, Jesus was was coming from Bethany. I just want to give you the context. Uh, During Passover, Jerusalem was the, the, the hub, the city, right? And it got crazy, the the, the population was inflated. There was, I mean, spare bedrooms full, right? Pulling out cots and blowing up air mattresses. People just sleeping in tents. The, the city was packed. So if you knew somebody in, in a suburb or something like that and you're wanting to be in Jerusalem during the Passover season, you would stay at a friend's house in the suburbs, a little bit away from the hustle and bustle. So, so Jesus had some friends in Bethany. And so by night, they would go stay in, at, at night at the friend's house and then they would take a short walk from the suburb into the city. His friends were, of course, Mary, Martha, and, and Lazarus, right? And, and just as recent as about a week ago, Lazarus was dead, but he had a pretty significant event happen. He was raised from the dead. So Lazarus is, Lazarus is alive now. That's a, he's had a big week, you know, big week for him. But, but so here we are, here we have Jesus. Uh, he was away from the crowds, and, and he's returning back to Jerusalem, And to recap to where we've been, uh, Jesus on Palm Sunday, uh, as he was approaching the city, and they're at the city of of Bethphage, which means the the house of figs is actually what it it translates to. And from that city, he said, right, go get me a donkey, guys. I I need myself a donkey. And, And on Palm Sunday, Jesus really, for the first time, he allowed himself to be treated like a king. Uh, for his time on earth, uh, Palm Sunday, the crowds laid out their coats. They waved the palm branches, saying Hosanna, right? They're saying Hosanna, praise be to God, almighty Lord in the highest, save now, save now. The irony of it all was that he was being treated like a king, but on the other side, the other, the other side of the coin, he, he's riding a donkey. And, and that's just kind of how, how Jesus, Jesus rolled. It was, there was irony within it all. There's all this glory and this and this majesty and this praising, and then there's a, you know, there's a donkey. It's just like, it just doesn't quite mix. And, and we would just expect a, a stallion, right? You'd be high on this, on this high horse and literally be able to look down on the people as they're praising you. And here's Jesus riding lowly on a donkey. 
And that's just how he was. There was majesty and meekness. There, there was power but, but in, in weakness. And a king, not, not the one you expected, but the one that you needed. And, and so I think of, like in Revelation chapter 5, as, as John's getting this sneak peek into heaven, and, and there's this, this like tragic moment where, where no one's worthy to, to open the scrolls, and there's like this, this like agony, and this, it's like, oh no, no one's worthy. And then one of the elders cries out from, from, from like John's, like he's in, the, in, the, in heaven, this glimpse, and, and an elder cries loud voice like, behold, the lion of Judah, he is worthy. He is victorious. He has overcome. He is able to open the scrolls. And, and so John's just thinking, I imagine, like, oh my goodness, the lion of Judah. What does the lion who is victorious look like? And, and he turns around and he sees a lamb that had appeared to have been slain. And so here comes this king riding in on a donkey. All that happens, Jesus walks into the temple, he looks around, he goes back to Bethany by night. And, and now we're reading this return journey back into the city, into Jerusalem. And so we have this here, he yells at a tree. And at verse 15, it says, And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple, and he began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. He overturned the tables, the money of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called the house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. And so this is, the, this is now the return journey back from the city, right? Palm Sunday, Bethany. Bethany to Jerusalem. Jerusalem flipping tables, yelling at people, uh, causing a scene. And now here we have the return trip home. It says, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered, said to him, Rabbi, look. The fig tree that you, that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass. It will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whatever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father, who also who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. It's comforting to me to know uh, I don't have to do another thing this morning that, that we got to read from, from God's word. And, and I, I, I get so selfish sometimes, I just want to get to what I have to say, but job's done. God, God's word is read. I think of how Jesus would say so many times as he would speak, for whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And that the responsibility doesn't fall on my part. If you have ears to hear, when God's word is read, you'll hear it. I can't convince you. I can't be clever enough. I can't be, have the perfect illustration enough that to, to, to make you hear. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And so uh, this word is sharper than any double-edged sword. There, there's power in the reading of God's word. It's Monday, and by Friday, Jesus will be on a cross, the, the last week uh, of his life on earth. Jesus resisted being treated like a king. The crowds tried to, to crown him at moments after the feeding of the 5,000s, and it says he retreated up into the mountains. It wasn't his, his time yet, but he referred to this week as his hour, as his time, as his cup that God had sent him to drink. And so we have Palm Sunday with, with the mark the beginning in being celebrated. He rides in like a king, and, and sometimes we just skip ahead, don't we? Like, okay, now the next thing is, is the Last Supper, but we have so much that happens in between here. We have so much. And, and so he, he goes and 
And on Monday, right after Palm Sunday, he yells at a fig tree. And then he goes straight into the temple area, and he almost goes berserk, what we would almost imagine, that flipping tables, throwing things around, like shouting at people for what they're doing and, and driving them out of, of the temple. And, and my house should be a house of prayer for, for all nations. And he was speaking, of course, that God had allotted outside of the temple the, the court of the Gentiles. So even, even, even in the Old Testament, in the, in the law, God had, had allotted a space for, for people outside of God's, God's chosen nation to, to come and to worship him to come and to, to, to praise him. And people from any nation, from any tribe, they could worship God too. They could offer a sacrifice at the temple too. And it became so distorted because it turned into an opportunity to make money, to rip people off, Jew and Gentile alike, right? You needed to convert your currency to the temple currency. And if you wanted to convert your currency to the temple currency, there was gonna be an upcharge, right? There's a fine to be able to do that. And then people would bring, bring along an animal to sacrifice, and, and, and they, the, 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 basically the Pharisees, the temple rulers, and the, and the people would come along and look at the animal that was brought and say, oh, you, you can't offer that. How, how dare you even propose that you would offer this as a sacrifice? Like, look at all the blemishes. And, you know, people would hang their head down. Well, dang, I really wanted to offer a sacrifice to God today. And they say, well, good, lucky for you, we have... We have, like, pre-certified animals that you can buy. And so, well, oh, great, how much does that cost? And it would be like, well, how much do you love God? And, and that's the kind of stuff that was going on. And so just taking advantage of people, and, and Jesus knew it, it, this was such a disservice to, to represent God this way, that this kind of behavior comes from hell, not heaven. And Jesus reacted strongly, fighting against this ugly thing that perverted God's heart and his desire. Okay, what about the tree, right? What did the tree ever do to anybody? Understand people ripping people off. That makes sense to us. But, but what, what did the tree do? do? Because this is, this is totally out of character for Jesus, we think. That Jesus is going to do this big, important thing. But first, I need to rebuke and curse a tree. Like, is this like Jesus, was he hangry? Like, you need a Snickers? You're not you when you're hungry? What's going on here? Like, uh, let, let's, let's, let's properly first uh, understand fig trees. So fig trees uh, that grew in Israel at this time and fig trees that grow, they, they would not produce leaves without first producing fruit. So fig trees were also synonymous with the nation of Israel. Uh, as God was telling the people about the, the promised land that they were going to be inheriting, that they were going to be moving into, what was coming for them, the, this, this, the, you're leaving Egypt, it's gonna, I got a land so much better for you, and that land was, was full of milk and honey. But in Deuteronomy 8.8, 8, it says, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees. Right? There are fig trees everywhere, and pomegranates, a land of olive trees, and honey. Fig trees were all over the place. Anybody ever eat a fig? Have you? Had a fig Newton. It's similar to a date. Yeah, it's pretty close. It's pretty close to a date. Um, but uh, I, I, I've only had fig Newtons. Never had an actual fig. But uh, travelers would eat them all the time. It was the perfect snack on the go. And so there are fig trees throughout the country, and as you're, as you're traveling about, I mean, these trees would just be lined, and, and, and you could pick off of them. And you could even eat them unripe. Uh, as, as, the, as, the little, as the little fruit would come, you could even eat those, and they're, I mean, they're super, super health, like healthy and beneficial. But as the buds would start to show on these trees, uh, the way the tree is made is that the buds start to show, and then the leaves are produced to, to, to shadow, to cover to, to help the, the fruit not get like fried out in the heat. And so the, the buds would always come first of the fruit, and then the leaves would produce to help protect the fruit. And, and if they had leaves, if a fig tree had leaves, it was because they already had fruit. So why is Jesus so mad? Why is he so mad? Like, give this little tree some grace, you know? Give it, give it a chance. Like, no one can ever eat from you again. 
Doesn't, doesn't that seem like, just not like Jesus in our minds? Because if we think of Jesus as, as, as miracles that we mentioned, as all of his miracles are all about like this magnifying, this glory, this like, oh my goodness, you're walking on water, you're doing these amazing things, but also healing and helping, aren't they? They're all about healing and helping people, resurrecting from the dead, helping the lame walk, the blind to see, heal the leper, and all this healing and helping. Like, why, why doesn't he just heal the tree? Why doesn't he give the tree a, a second chance? You know, c- come on, little guy, you can do it. You can produce fruit. Like, w- w- what's going on here? I thought Jesus was, was long-suffering and, and a God of second chances and, and, and all that good stuff. But, but if you look back, this tree is, is almost turned into this living component of a parable that Jesus had told. And so a parable is simply an earthly story, an earthly story with heavenly meaning. It was stories that Jesus would tell that, that would have earthly elements to it that we would understand, that the people he was speaking to would understand, that would relate and it would have a heavenly purpose and meaning behind it. And this tree, this fig tree, turns in, it, into a real life parable. But he told a parable in Luke chapter 13 prior to this. At Luke 13, verse 6, he says, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit and found none on it. And he said to the the vine dresser, the gardener, the guy taking care of it, look, for three years now, I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and and I found none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And I could probably, there's an applicable, applicable lesson here. I could probably preach a whole sermon uh, on why have, have wasted things that are taking space up in your life that aren't producing fruit. You know, just like in the garden, if you, if you plant a whole bunch of stuff and it's not, it's not growing, you know, it's not doing anything, it's not producing anything, like, don't just let it stand there, you know, like, rip it out, tear it out, plant something new that's going to produce some fruit in it. In the same way, we have so many areas in our lives that we allow to take up so much space and, and it's not producing any fruit in your life, so there, there, there's a lesson there. Cut that tree down. It's not producing. Let me get something good in its place that will provide fruit. But the guy taking care of the vineyard, he makes a case to Jesus to keep the tree. At verse 8, the guy answers, he says, Sir, let it alone this year also until I, I dig around it. I have a plan. I'm going to dig around it and, and put on manure. And, and then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. And now we almost reached the conclusion to this parable here on this Monday of Passion Week where Jesus is saying, I I, I will wait. I will be long-suffering. I will be patient, but I'm not going to wait forever. The the tree, we would need to understand as well, this tree had three years. It wasn't the first three years of its life. He didn't expect a tree within the first three years of its life to produce any fruit. Fig tree, three years needs time to grow. And actually, a lot in the Old Testament, the fourth year, as it started to produce fruit, all of that would be given to God. So this tree had, had, had moments. It's not a brand new tree. Understand this. This is, the tree was allotted three years to grow, and then it was given another three years. No fruit. God is long-suffering. God is patient. But there comes a point where we run out of opportunity. And we can't just presume that there's going to be God's grace there. And, and that's why if you're, feeling, if you're ever feeling God call on your heart, God ever pulling at, you, at your, your heartstrings, and, and if you ever feel that happening, it, it's never a good idea to put it off. It's never a good idea to have a decision placed before you by God and to say, oh, I'll take care of that later. It's never a good idea, young people, to think, oh, I'll get right with God after I'm older, when I'm married. It's never a good idea to think, oh, I'll have another, op- another chance will come. You, you can get locked into your decision to have a hard heart. We aren't guaranteed tomorrow. There's such a danger in thinking of I'll get right later. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. So Jesus has reached this point, and he's spoken to this tree, cursing it. Why? Remember, the tree is a picture of Israel, which only yesterday, only the day before, Israel had had gathered alongside the road, placed their cloaks down, and and waved leaves, palm branches, praising Jesus. On Sunday, Hosanna. 
And this same fickle crowd that was on Palm Sunday praising and worshiping Jesus would take part in, in stealing from people on Monday. And, and by Friday, oh, Sunday, Hosanna, but by Friday they'd be shouting, crucify him. And Pilate would say, should I, should I crucify your king? I mean, you just, what happened to Palm Sunday? You said Jesus was king, and should, should, I, should, I, should I kill your king? And what do they say? He's not our king. Our only king is, is Caesar. And so the first point I want to make to you today is that Sundays need to change our Mondays. Jesus knew for most of them, shouting Hosanna and treating him like king, the vast majority of the crowd, their words would amount to nothing but leaves. What he's trying to say is that living well matters more than looking good. Putting on a show of religion. Putting on a show of worship. Putting on a big talk about loving God. All show and, and, and no go is a big problem with Jesus. Living a, a pretty Sunday, but an ugly Monday, that, that's, that's all leaves and no fruit. And it's fruit that we're after. You don't get fruit by just saying we live for King Jesus. It's real easy to say I live for King Jesus. But, but so many who say Jesus is king are, are just like the mob. That, that by the time Friday rolls around Caesar's king of their lives, right? They're caught up in, in politics. What's going to happen with a presidential election? There's a State of the Union address, and, and there's all this stuff going on, and Caesar's king by Friday, or, or maybe you're just king by Friday of your life. Jesus was king on Sunday, but now it's Friday night, and I, I had a long week. I had a, I had a struggling week. And, and Jesus, yeah, sure, Jesus will be king again on Sunday, but for tonight, uh, this bottle is, is, is king. Sure, I say Jesus is king and I love him and stuff, but stuff you're looking at on your phone, I don't know. We need fruit, people. How do we get it? You've seen it before, but let's look at it again. Galatians 5.22, fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, right? fruit like faithfulness, right? Gentleness, self-control, such things there is no law. But verse 24, it says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So we focus on the fruits, that's good, but how do we get there? We live by the Spirit. We let the Holy Spirit be in control of our lives. So many of us give Jesus the lip service but, but we want to be Caesar, and we hold on to the control. We want to be king. We want, we want to decide. And a king is someone we bow down before and do what they say. And, and the idea of a king is great. Right? Think of the nation of Israel. We just want a king. We just want a king. Wouldn't a king be great? And then they get Saul. It's a good, it, it sounds nice. Like we, we want a king who's going who's gonna to share part of his treasure with us and, and a king that's going to make our problems disappear and, and, and a king who's going to take care of my life. But at the end of the day, we want to do what we just want to do. We don't want to be told what to do. But if we want the fruit that God is after, we can't just talk the good talk and live ugly lives. We have to allow day by day for the Holy Spirit to be in control. And it's not something that we're forcing it. We're not straining. We're not, we're not trying to make it happen. It's just, it's just living in the Spirit. As you, as you live in the Spirit and as you follow Jesus, as you, as you die to yourself and lay down your cross and follow him, you just walk with him. You just watch like just, just wild, wild berries. Just, oh, there's some fruit. You know, it's not like this straining and striving thing. It's just walking with Jesus like, oh, Here's fruit. Oh, here's some more fruit. And it'll, you will just allow it just to, just to, just to produce from your life. We, we are after life change. If Sunday doesn't change the Monday, the Sunday doesn't matter. So how can we not be like this tree and be all leaves and, and, and no fruit? Well, I think a big thing would be credibility. I think we need, as Christians, as believers, who, people who, who proclaim Jesus as king, we need credibility. What this tree did is it broadcasted to the world 
look at me, I have fruit. But as you approached it, lifted up the branches, moved the leaves aside, it's like, you're saying one thing, but what's actually there is different. You're lacking some credibility here, Mr. Tree. Do you have credibility? Do you do what you will say you will do? Don't be the person that what you say often doesn't materialize. Don't be the person that at work with, with friends, don't be a person that what you say does not match up with what you do. Don't ever overpromise and then underdeliver. Be the person that when you speak it, it's going to happen. So it will be. Integrity and honesty, it's even things that, that this world can see. It's something that this world actually even desires. When, when they see this happen in someone's life, it, it stands out. It's, it's different from the crowd. When they, when they look at Jesus' followers, credibility is something that should mark us, define us, a common characteristic. I think of Proverbs 25, 14, where like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts a gift he does not give. Don't let your leaves speak one thing, but the evidence say quite the contrary. I think the next thing we see that, that we need is spiritual intensity. Spiritual intensity. Uh, you could, could use the word faith here because that's the word that, that Jesus used. And it's, it's, it's a good Bible word, but I feel like so often it just gets driven into the ground and it gets dulled in our minds. Right? Just, just have faith. And we say, oh, of course, yeah, have faith. So I, I want to choose, I want to think of it this way today as, as spiritual intensity. Right? We have Peter walking away, rocking around saying, Rabbi, look at that tree. You, you, you cursed it and to die, and it, it did. Jesus says, have faith. Like, does that impress you? Have faith in God. If, if you'd have some faith, you, you could speak to that mountain there and tell it to go in a sea, and it would. And so we need to understand uh, Jesus isn't calling us to go to Glacier National Park this summer and go, go find Mount Cleveland, which I think I believe is the highest mountain in Glacier, Glacier National Park, and say, hey, hey, go to the Pacific Sea. Okay? There, there's some context that matters. In, in this day and time, th this was a common expression of something that would be impossible. Right? Oh, sure, I would love to do that, but when, when mountains go into the sea, you know, I'll, we'll see it happen. It was that common expression of that day, like, hey, what do you think about, oh, sure, just as likely as a mountain moving, like, when hell freezes over kind of type, type phrasing, or, 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 or when pigs fly, you know, that, we'll see that happen. And, and uh, Jesus kind of made that happen, so I don't know if that one really works. But, um, but, but what Jesus is saying is if you, had, if you had faith, if you had spiritual intensity in your life, the thing that you think is impossible, it can be done with God. And, and I, I, I'd encourage each and every one of us just, just, to, just to turn up the temperature of our spiritual intensity. Just, just to turn it up. So like sometimes we as Christians, we, we walk around and, and, and we're just like, slump down and, and just a thing happens and we just, story of my life. Oh, here, here we go again. Like, I just feel like a modern day Job just, just piling on me. And the devil's at work again. Look, look at the devil go. Look, look at the world. We're just, we're just doomed. Life is so bad. That figures. Figures that would happen. Bump, flat tire, that figures. And we, we carry around with us a lot of this time, I think, this, this victim mentality. Or is there, is there faith in God? That you, that you believe in God's promises over your life. You believe that he has a plan. You believe he's up to something. Like, don't think your marriage is over. Don't believe that your marriage is gonna be a struggle the rest of your life. Have faith in God. Don't, don't give up. Don't act, don't act defeated here on earth. Uh, uh, another day of work. Here we go again. 
Like, come on, believe that the God of the universe has a purpose and a plan in line for you today. That, that he has his Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God is living inside of you. That, that he has a purpose for you, that impossible things can be done through faith. I, I refuse to, to look around at this church and just believe that, that this is all that's there. I refuse to, to look at you and think, as, as a man of God, that, that what's placed with inside of you, I, I refuse to look at you and just see that's all that's there. I, I want to see the, 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 the God-given potential within your life un, untapped. I want to see it when, when things click in your life and you truly understand what Jesus has done for you and I, you understand the power of the Holy Spirit that has dwelled within you. And I want to see that take over your life and I want to see the fruit. I, I refuse to just believe what I see with my eyes. Don't just go into church. Here we go, another day at church. Don't just casually show up to, to work, to school. Don't just casually walk through the doors of your house. Go out on assignment into a broken world. Don't be lukewarm. Don't, don't be tepid. Don't, don't give in to those who have given up. Like, pull your shoulders back. Like, have some pep in your step as you go into your day. Live on purpose, live on fire, live with spiritual intensity. I, I just dare you to, to live that way. A double dog dare you. Just, just approach your day like tomorrow. Li live, a, live a bigger story. Believe that God is for you. What a better way to live. The next thing I see is the importance of relationship over duty relationship over duty. Have faith, move mountains. But as you pray, if there's someone to forgive, you need to go do that first. If you think that there's some kind of favor you can win with God by doing anything for him, just understand it, he values relationship way over, way more than anything else he could do. A, a, lack, a, a lack of forgiveness we see here. This is crazy. This is, this is wild even. It's a, it blows my mind. A, a lack of forgiveness relationally it will hinder your life spiritually. I, I mean, I, I could go on for a while on this, but I just preached on it two weeks ago, so go check that out if you didn't see it, but, but here it is again. Any religious activity you think you could do that would make things right or when you credit with God, it, it's, it's all worthless if you have terrible relationships. Next thing I see that I really want to dwell on here, and we'll close with this, wow, I say that. That was a 20 minute closing. What the heck? The, 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 I think the true key uh, to, this, to this Monday and Passion Week that Jesus is, was frustrated with, that he's trying to instill in us still today, is this idea of authenticity. Authenticity. I see in this text that we should live authentic lives especially with God, especially when we're flawed. But to be authentic with people, it's, it's when, when people look at you, what they see is what they get. It's, it's the opposite of playing a part. It's the opposite of, of wearing a mask. It's, it's, we're, not, we're not faking it. We're not, we're not faking that everything's fine. Oh, I'm fine. How are you doing? Fine. It's, it's fine. I think uh, of, of Pastor Tim Keller. He said that the reason a tree, a uh, fig tree, would produce leaves but, but no fruit would be a disease within. The reason why it would be even possible, because this, normally this wasn't possible, if there was leaves, there would be fruit. They just went hand in hand. The reason this would happen is because there would be a disease within but faking fine. Something's wrong on the inside, but outwardly I'm just saying, I'm good. Let me ask you a question. Are you the kind of person that fakes fine? Or are you authentic? Are you authentic? Are you authentic before God? And you, are, you, are you authentic with God's people? Or when you, are you hurting when you're in pain, when you're struggling, when you're suffering, do you just shove fig leaves all over to hide what's really going on? No one, I, no one needs to see this. The act of, of covering up 
a lack of authenticity. That, that, that act, that, that behavior, that stance of covering up and no authenticity, it prompted the only destructive miracle Jesus performed. Mm. This is the only time he did a miracle that destroyed and didn't help. He's saying something. Something important. Something crucial. Sending a message. He's not into covering things up. Not into that. Not even a bit. And it's so often in life, isn't the cover-up worse than the crime? It's true. The, the crime, the, the, the crime if, you would, if you would put that before God, he can do something with that. It's called confession. It's called repentance. Going up to someone and saying, I'm sorry, I own what I did. I'm going to make it right. That, that's, that's a very hard thing to respond to negatively. That God can deal with. The cover-up, he, he can't do anything with that. He, he can't forgive a sin that you won't even recognize as a sin in your life. You won't admit to having done. It's a story as old as time. It's the story of man from the very beginning, isn't it? In the Garden of Eden, Ad, Adam and Eve, right there, they went chasing fruit from the wrong tree. And then immediately after, look, in Genesis 3, 7, the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed. You can say it. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Then, as Adam and Eve were covered up in nothing but leaves, at verse 8, it says they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, what they do? Hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They hid when they heard the sound of God walking in the garden. This used to be like the highlight of their day. This used to be the, the best part of every day. And they, they would hear God walking through the, like, what's that, what's that sound like? Oh, I want to know. I want to know. I want to know what the sound of God walking sounds like. And, but they would, they would delight in this. They would spend time with God. But now what? They hid. And this, this reveals a deep truth in every one of us that concealed sin will make you dread what you once delighted in. Do I need to repeat it? Concealed sin will make you dread what you once delighted in. So now God, he's there. What's next? Hey, you two idiots, what are you doing behind those bushes? No, he, he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Even when we mess up, he calls out to us. He says, where are you? He knows exactly where they are. But he says, Adam, Eve, where are you? Giving the space to come clean. Giving the space to do something with it. But the cover-up is almost worse than it is. It's worse than the crime. They, they didn't fess up to what they did. They shifted the blame. It was the serpent. Eve made me do it pointing fingers and, and not accepting and responsibility and receiving that. And, and as long as you shift the blame, you stay the same. There's no life change when you try to shift blame. And so finally, they get doled out judgment. But you see the heart of the Father. The moment, the moment they were finally open with him and, and honest about what they had done, you see this in verse 21. It says, and the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. See, he had something so much better for them to wear than fig leaves. But what it took, it took the death 
of an innocent third party, but he covered them with the principle of substitution. This had to die so you could be covered with something better. Plan set in motion, introducing the cross from the very beginning. And that's why Jesus cursed this tree, because this tree was wearing nothing but fig leaves. And he hates when we cover up what he wants to cure us from. That's why in Galatians 3.13, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He cursed a tree because he came to die on a tree and be the curse for us to cure what is actually wrong with us. He, he wants to, to heal you. He's been, he's been running after you the whole time. Receive his grace. The Bible says we can confess our sins to, to God and be forgiven. And, and when we confess them to each other, we will be healed. So the Bible says, as pastor, I don't want a culture here where we put on this expectation that we need to hide what's really going on underneath. I don't want to put forth that expectation that, that you can't show up on a Sunday unless if your life is 100. I don't want to put that expectation that you have to have the picture frame perfect family, life, marriage, uh, and then that's what it needs to take. If, if it doesn't look that way, then just, just cover up with some leaves. Cover those blemishes. Don't, don't let people see your mistakes. Don't let people see your problems. Don't let people see your sin. I don't want to put that expectation on everybody can, can we be broken and be vulnerable so we can be healed and helped? It's a question. Can we? God can't help us be clean if we won't come clean. I don't want to be too harsh. I don't know, but I think like I've been here a year and I don't know, out of like 250, 300 people, like maybe two or three of you are struggling in sin. Everybody else is doing great. Yeah. You believe that? I don't. I think all the altar calls I had here since I've been here in a year, I was trying to remember, and I don't have a great memory. Have we had one man come forward at an altar call? I can't remember. Man, you're doing great, huh? You're doing great with the leaves. I don't, I don't know. I'm not going to apologize. That's my flesh. I just want to apologize. Speak through me, God. Am I putting out that expectation that my life is perfect? I, I'm try, I try to be real. I try to be authentic with you. And maybe you're here today and your life amounts to fig leaves, to, to religion, to do this, to memorize this and, and give that and, and be here and, and do that. And, and what you are trying to do is you're trying to, to pay your own bill that you can't afford. The only hope for any of us is not that we do good. It's that we trust Jesus did good. And I just want to give an invitation to anyone today feeling called by Jesus. That there's, there's an urgency. There's an urgency to the gospel. I think so, so oftentimes we, pre we preach forgiveness and, and, and he loves you and he accepts you. But you have to understand, there, there comes a day where the opportunity's gone and the tree dies. When there are no more opportunities, no more second chances, I think of this week as I was doing my Bible club duty and the kids were just wild this week. I don't know what it was. I didn't even talk to Tammy afterwards, I guess. So I, I, I heard you. I didn't even see you. I heard your voice. 
the kids were wound. And my youngest group of kids were just grabbing each other, fighting and running around and going crazy. And I try to be the fun guy, you know, the fun pastor. I want to be the fun pastor. I don't want to be known as the, the, the Bible-thumping pastor. I want to be the fun guy. That's my identity. And, and I had to say to all the kids, we're done. You still have five minutes left. We're going to sit single file, crisscross style. That's what you have to say now. Crisscross, can't say Indian style. Crisscross, <laughs> we're sitting down, and we're going to be quiet. We're going to get control of our bodies, and we're going to be quiet. And, and there's always one. Isn't there always one? He kept wanting to talk back. And I said, be quiet now, or you're going to time out. And so I have this like instilled in me, especially after being in law enforcement, that when you tell somebody you're gonna do something, you, I mean, I speak it plainly. You do this or this is going to happen. And so when that doesn't happen, what I say I'm gonna do is gonna happen. And so I picked up that little boy, not my child, nobody's gonna bring their kid, kid to Bible club anymore. I picked up that little boy, I pulled him outside of the sanctuary, said, all right, you're going to, you're going to time out. He screamed. <laughs> and he said, uh, no, no, please, I, I, I'll be quiet, I'll be quiet. And I'm, I'm, so, I'm such a baby. I brought him back in, sat him down. He was quiet. And I read this parable, and I see that in so many people's lives where Jesus is going to that tree, and he's saying, again, there's still no fruit? There's still the cover-up? Still? And we just cry and beg out, just give me one more chance. Just, just give me one more opportunity. Give me one more year. I, I, I promise I'll, I'll, I'll fertilize. I'll create some space. I'll get my life right. I'll, I'll go to church. I'll, I'll pray more often. I'll, I'll do the thing. And, and, and there comes an opportunity and a point in time. And it's just another year and another year. And then Jesus sees that. And it's like, okay, time's up. The ax is at the root of the tree, is what John the Baptist said. Time to chop it down and to cast it into the fire. He said, if you die without being forgiven your sins, trying to cover them up, you go to hell. That's what happens. And he's, he's a way more just father than I am. What he says he's going to do will happen. And you think, oh, just give me one more year. Just give me one more Sunday. Just give me one more altar call. Uh, next time, I'll stop covering up. I'll come forward. What are you waiting for? Waiting for the, that, that time where Jesus is going to say, okay, today's your appointed day. Your time on earth is done. The most important thing you had to do with your time on earth was to decide what to do with me. What would you do with me? Did you put your faith in me? Did you say I was king? Did you say I was king? Then did you go on Monday and stole from people, lied, cheated? Then Friday rolls around, Saturday rolls around. What are you going to do with Jesus? If you're ready to trust Jesus, I just, I, I beg you, I implore with you to make it now, here, and today. If you've already put your faith and trust in Jesus, but you have sin you're trying to conceal, I hope you see yourself in Adam and Eve. I hope, I hope that resonates with you, that the best part of their lives, walking with God in the garden, that they used to delight in, they, they now wanted to hide. I wonder, like, maybe you used to love your, your wife or husband, and that was the delight of, of your day, getting to spend time with together and then there's some hidden concealed sin within that marriage and now you get like nervous if, if they even like grab your phone you're like nervous what they they might see that the text messages or or the, the pictures or 
your, your internet search history, and it's like the thing that we used to delight in, now I'm just like pins and needles hoping I don't get, hopefully nobody comes and ruffles these leaves and searches for fruit in my life, because maybe the thing that you used to delight in is, is agony for you now. I'm telling you, the, the next step is to confess, to stop, stop showing something to the world that isn't true. Stop, stop showing to the world that, that there's fruit here and, and there's nothing. God can do something with the confession. He can forgive it. He can heal it. You can repent from it. But as long as we stay concealed, mm, the only destructive miracle Jesus had ever performed was because of the cover-up. When he looked at that tree and there was nothing but leaves. Let's pray. Precious Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, Lord. I thank you that you are patient, you are long-suffering. I think of how patient you are with me in my life. But Father, I pray that you would help us to to have eyes to see and ears to hear that when, when we won't confess, when we won't repent, when we won't put our faith and trust and hope in you, when all we do is offer lip service but we don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, when we just give you lip service and religion but we don't actually have Jesus in our heart as Lord and Savior, when we don't actually have the evidence of that, that, that fruit that is thriving in our lives, Lord, that, the, that you say that there are consequences that are coming, that you are long-suffering, but you are just, that you are patient, but you are a God of promise, that you love us, you made a way for each and every one of us, but you are so holy, you cannot dwell amongst sin. That Adam and Eve had to, had to be banished, Father, I pray that every one of us, that you would have a good, long, hard look at every one of us. Examine our hearts. Look into our lives as Laura prayed. And God, I pray that you would reveal within us, that you would show us the areas of our life that aren't producing fruit. Quite the contrary. It's even faking that there is. Father, I pray that uh, you would allow this time and space for the person who's been trying to do it their way, trying to pay their own bill, trying to go to church enough Sundays, trying to just presume that grace is going to be there at the end. Lord, I don't want any of us to presume. I want us to have assurance. I want them to be assured that, that when this life ends, and this life will, that when they stand face to face with you, that they, uh, I, I want them the assurance that they will be looked upon, they will be seen, not with their sin, but with you covering over them, that your precious blood would cover over their sin and wash it white as snow that the cup you had to drink, Jesus. I thank you so much you drank that cup of agony, of pain, of suffering, of, of the penalty. Thank you, Jesus, so much for drinking that cup so we would never have to taste it. That you took it all on, on your back. You took it all on the cross. Father, I pray that you would allow... Uh, an atmosphere, uh, an environment here, Lord, where we aren't faking it, where we aren't trees with nothing but leaves. But Lord, I pray that you would allow us to be vulnerable with each other, to be authentic with each other, to be real with each other. God, I pray that we wouldn't portray one thing and have it to be the farthest from the truth when it's behind the doors of our house. God, would you just reveal in me the sin that I need to confess? Thank you, Jesus, that 
you allow us to be healed, that you give us this, we have this opportunity here and today. I pray we don't squander it. I pray we don't waste it. I pray we do what we are called to do today, to walk in the spirit, to allow him to lead, allow you to be king of our lives. Thank you, Jesus. I pray all this in your name. Amen. Please join us. Thank you for the greatest gift, the gift of salvation and peace. Knowing you, may we take these elements that represent your body, your blood, to honor you, to worship you, to serve you. Father, guide us, direct us. Help us to surrender it all. Serve you.
And Father God, as we lay our sins on the altar, Heavenly Father, and thank you. Thank you for the salvation that's been brought to all. And we partake of the emblems, Heavenly Father, the bread, the representation of your body and the blood, Heavenly Father, that flows from Calvary, the wine that we take, Heavenly Father. Bless us, O Lord, as we go through this week. Help us, Heavenly Father, to be your children and to be the tree, Heavenly Father, that is live with fruit and share it with those that we come in contact with. Lord, we love you. We love your son because it is through his name we pray. Amen. Will you please stand with us? Um, we can bring all our burdens, all our troubles, all the things that are withering, dying, not productive, not of Jesus, and we can leave them right here at the cross 
and we can go out in victory today. Will you please join? that we have victory found in Jesus. God, that because of the cross, Lord, all of, our, all of our faults, all of our failures, all of our sin, God, it's wiped clean. God, we have new life found in Jesus. So thank you, Lord, for the cross. Thank you, Jesus, that uh, you lived such a perfect life. God, that you died for us to cover us. Thank you that we aren't covered in something as fickle as leaves, but we are covered by the blood of Jesus. I pray that we would go out uh, into our day uh, just as Jesus looked at Peter. I almost wonder if he's just kind of surprised, like you're surprised by that, Peter? Have faith. I pray that uh, we would walk about and people look at us and see our lives and say, what, what changed in you? And we could just say, maybe that's impressive. Have faith. See what God could do in your life. I pray that we would walk out with our shoulders back a little, that we'd find victory in the cross, that we would find purpose, that we would be sent out on mission day by day. God, that the Sunday would change our Mondays, that it would change our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for including us. Thank you, Jesus for dying for us. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name I pray. Amen.